Did you know formaldehyde can enter a home through products like engineered wood furniture, computers, carpeting, treated fabrics, hairsprays, and cleaning materials? These potentially harmful VOCs can circulate throughout indoor living spaces and affect the air you breathe. According to the EPA, poor indoor air quality has been linked to headaches, fatigue, allergies, asthma, and more. The good news is you can ensure your client's air is clean with Certainty Air Renew Drywall. Air Renew Indoor Air Quality Drywall is the first of its kind patent pending drywall that actively cleans the air by permanently removing formaldehyde. When airborne formaldehyde comes in contact with the board through normal air circulation, Air Renew Drywall captures the formaldehyde and converts it into a safe inert compound, keeping it safely within the drywall. Air Renew Drywall cuts, installs, and finishes just like a regular drywall and comes in type X, moisture, and mold resistant for multiple solutions. The board looks, installs, and finishes just like standard drywall. It also is available in MT2 Tech Moisture and Mold Resistant and Type X, so it can help fit multiple. Indoor air performance tests prove that Air Renew permanently removes formaldehyde. It has been validated by their ULE through their Environmental Claims Validations Program. It works with most water-based acrylic and epoxy-based paints. Go ahead and check out Certainteed St. Gobain Air Renew uh, VOC eating drywall today. Hi, well, welcome to the tour of the Acorn Glade Passive House new build. This course is approved for um, half an hour in Nary Green, Certified Green Professional, GBCI, AIBD, uh, Certified Green Home Professional. Um, this one is actually approved for Passive House as well and also approved for uh, Building Performance Institute under non whole house training. Um, we're also approved for one hour in continuing ed for uh, AIA HSW, and that may also make it applicable to your local state-based design or contractor license. Uh, for this course, I'll be your producer, interviewer, camera phone operator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. And we're going to be bringing you behind the scenes um, from here on out on um, all the most innovative innovative, sustainable, net positive, restorative um, residential living spaces that you can think of, uh, single family, multifamily, mid-rise, high-rise, mixed use, uh, urban, rural, uh, suburban, uh, new construction, renovation, gut, additions, you name it, we'll be there to bring you behind the scenes. Uh, for this particular course, we're going to be joining the architect and the builders for an exclusive walkthrough of a passive house and Green Star certified home. We'll be focusing on advanced HVAC systems, improved indoor air quality, um, air quality monitoring, black water remediation, and how to achieve an all electric, low energy home in your new construction design. So uh, join us and hope you have a good time. All right, well, I'm Brandon Weiss with Evolutionary Home Builders. Uh, this is called the Acorn Blade Passive House. This was a, a project that we teamed up with Tom Bass at Dilly Architects for. Uh, that they designed the project and we built it, but we worked together as an integrated design team uh, approach with the client, builder, architect, all together at the same table from the very beginning of the design. So uh, that's great when there's so many different goals on a project to be able to get everyone's kind of insight and you know uh, really make the best product possible. So um, this is going. To, it's currently pending Passive House certification through the Passive House Institute, United States. So really excited about that, uh, which means Passive House is the certification that is the strictest in terms of energy uh, in the world. So uh, you basically have to, it's regionally designed so that you have certain targets you want to hit for heating load and cooling load and heating demand and cooling load, uh, demand. And also air tightness and all these things that incorporate into energy efficiency. And one of the bit hardest targets is the primary energy. So how much energy is this project totally consuming? So those are all the metrics that we had to design and build to. Uh, which is a challenge on both parts, you know. So on the building side, I'll speak from, because I'm the builder, this is Tom, the architect, uh, was, you know, total craftsmanship during construction. You know, everything's got to be well-crafted, and it's everything you don't see as a homeowner at the very end when you live in the home. But what's behind the walls is really one of the major players in, in total home quality. I mean, that's how you control moisture, vapor. Um, that's what's really driving the energy efficiency of the structure. So we take really good pride in what we do and how we craft our homes. And 
we also have to do our own quality control testing during construction. So we put ourselves under some rigorous demands that uh, not even the client told us to, just to make sure we are happy with our own product. So we do all of our own testing, and then we bring in the third-party rater after we've already confirmed that we're at the goal we want to achieve. And that's from an energy standpoint. One of my major passions is health and wellness uh, too, and how we can actually impact the uh, the human health and wellness of our occupants, which is now you know scientifically and medically proven. And you know, so we're taking kind of that scientific approach to our construction methodologies. Uh, one of our premium products actually uh, can guarantee that if a homeowner lives in one of our homes, that we can guarantee certain health metrics that can be tested pre and post occupancy by a medical doctor to prove that you are now healthier living in our structure. So that's kind of the dream with when we go to top of the line on everything. But even this house, we test all of our buildings uh, post construction. Um, pre-occupancy for indoor air quality. So we bring in a lab that comes in and tests for VOCs, formaldehyde counts, um, radon, mold spore counts, all these things that can uh, impact someone's health and make sure that it is living up to uh, our, again, rigorous standards before we turn that project over to our clients. Um, so that's what we do as evolutionary home builders. We're actually in the process now of launching a modular home company, which is gonna do all these great things, but um, built in a factory environment where we can really control it in quality control test things much faster than we can do in the field. So uh, we're talking six months delivery on a project like this uh, and completely done, just kind of seamed together on site. Uh, that company's called Devel, D-V-E-L-E, and that website's up and we're just kind of starting launching that program too. So um, different sites, you know, require different things. So we kind of want to have that flexibility and this is a way we feel we can scale and really bring this kind of building to the masses. So. Turn it over to Tom and Tom can yeah. get some of his. Well, let's side. move inside where it's cooler and we don't have to smell the septic field. <laughs> and listen to the Cardinal just like, you know, he's a heckler. Yeah. Um, so just you can slip off your shoes uh, inside the door or put on some little uh, protective booties here on the way in, okay? Just go in the living room to set up, all right? Just so people can. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Are you going to introduce yourself too, real quick? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're just waiting to set up right now, but we are live. If you have any questions, please let us know. I'm talking to my camera. Yeah, so the septic system was sort of something we had to design around. Um, and we could only put basically plants. You can't put any trees or shrubs right. in that area. So we basically have like a prairie habitat sort of here in this middle area, the prairie habitat back here, and then a small patio. Everything sort of has more natural. As you do it all, it's basically what we're all about. This is more of a design. Sure. Look around. This area here is going to be screened out. Yeah, it's going to be a more of a courtyard. So they're going to want to come over to the house. Might do this, just do a little quick. But in terms of the ratio of control to nature, the both. Just taking a quick look before we get started. So, so anybody here architects? All right, good. Uh, working in Chicago? Nice. Yeah. Um, anybody here know what a passive house is? Well, you just heard it from Brandon. So, yeah. Most people are going to be pretty familiar these days. When we started this five years ago, 2012, uh, 2013, I guess, was the first one we did. It was the first passive house in Chicago. So we were. Spending a lot of time talking about that, and you know, it's interesting in a technical way, but um, there's a lot of good stuff going on here design-wise. So I want to talk a little more about that, especially since Brandon has talked about the um, the kind of technical side of constructing it. So I'm Tom Bassett-Dilly. I'm the architect of this house, and the owners, Tom Smith and Jen Telerico. That's Tom over there. You can catch him after the tour or during the tour. Um, we're repeat clients. We did a remodel for them, and then they were looking at some major stuff they needed to do in that house. And we came up with a design, did some preliminary budget, and said, you know, it's just, it's just too much. Let's build a new house. So 
Um, they found this lot, which is kind of a dream uh, lot for me in terms of like, you know, it's totally walkable in terms of the train being right there. It has these beautiful trees on it. It's quiet and secluded, and yet it's close to downtown Dennis Grove. And a nice, nice situation. And then here are these clients that we just really saw eye to eye with design-wise. That wanted to pass a house and wanted to share it with people, you know. So, um, so the way the design kind of shaped up was we were trying to make a small economical house that would be big enough for them, the family of three, um, and not have a lot of excess, have a nice, simple, kind of clean, sort of Asian-inspired aesthetic, and really give them good indoor-outdoor connections and connection to nature, you know. So this is the psychological side of health. And for me, as an architect, I think about it in terms of, like, how do you really feel secure and comfortable and, and you know, fulfilled, if you want to call it that, in your home. So, um, so some of the things we did is just, you know, the, the, the layout and the design, keeping it simple. Um, but a lot of it really kind of came down to materials. So um, on the site before we built the house, there were some walnut trees standing here. And we had to put the house right here because the septic tank could only go where it was. And there were setbacks. So we were really limited. So I'm like, well, we don't want to cut down those walnut trees. What can we do with them? So we, we milled them into the boards that you see on that wall there, that beautiful kind of feature wall, incorporated them into the house, so kind of created that memory and that sense of reuse and extension of life. Um, the rest of the, um, the house is basically characterized by this maple trim. We want to keep it light and sort of unify everything with these lines that sort of travel around. See you, Dave. Thanks for coming. And, um, and the, the house is designed on a, on a grid system because we're using what's called advanced framing. So we have studs at two foot on center. So we had to lay out all the studs because it had to align with the joists and the rafters and everything had to just sort of stack up like in this three-dimensional matrix. So what you see is um, the windows tend to be on like, that's two units, so that's a four foot rough opening. Well, three foot, ten and a half because you got to take off half the stud on each side. Um, so since these are European windows that are basically custom designed, we can make them whatever size we want. That's the European standard as opposed to having a chart, you know, of standard window sizes. So everything's kind of on this grid system, and then the, the maple trim that's kind of going through and defining the space is, is reiterating that, uh, you know, those grid lines, sort of tying it all together. So, um, so main space here, you're seeing it, uh, you know, kitchen, living, dining, all kind of flowing. Uh, we have the tall window on the south to kind of bring light in and reflect it on the ceiling and, and uh, still leave a lot of room for the kitchen function over there. Um, Upstairs on the east side of the house here are the bedrooms, so they're kind of, this is a private, kind of quiet part of the lot, so we face all the bedrooms off to the east into the big oak tree. And then on the south, since as a passive house we want to gain all the free heat we can in the wintertime, um, those big windows there on the south are, are doing that without you know, compromising privacy and also creating a view from in here to that beautiful oak tree and that kind of sense of like the wooded vista beyond. So we're trying to create this illusion of you know, space and living in the woods. Uh, we designed these beautiful shoji screens that aren't here yet. <laughs> They're a later phase. We had to kind of do some phasing for budget reasons. Um, but that's sort of a that's a buffer zone there. If you have a guest, if you have the shoji screens, it can be a guest space. It can be a, a you know, workspace. Um, right now, it's the TV zone. Um, and then upstairs, you'll see this kind of a, what they call the flex room, and that's that that's right now it's a playroom and a, a sort of a, a home uh, workshop kind of thing. But over the time, that can sort of change function. So I think that's one of the things with a, with a small house especially. You've got to think about the programmed needs, but you also have to leave a little flexibility for the way life changes and, you know, kids grow up and whatever happens. So, um, so why don't we go upstairs and we'll talk a little bit about sort of the mechanical systems and some of the details and layouts up there. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. No, it's good. Yeah. Be close. So when you get up here, you'll notice that uh, downstairs we had the concrete floor, and I should have mentioned while we were down there that's a. Uh, slab on grade, so there's about four inches of insulation underneath that slab. So the slab is always room temperature. It's not like an old, you know, your parents' basement where the slab was cold. 
Um, up here, it's a salvaged uh, maple floor that we got from a factory. It used to be a terracotta factory in uh, Chicago that used to make that beautiful Louis Sullivan terracotta that you see around downtown Chicago. Um, and so we, we got this, um, basically my project manager went over and, and said, I want this much, please. And we bought it and uh, brought it in here and they, you know, sanded it. So all the character marks you see are, you know, from having spent many years as a hardworking floor in, in Chicago. Um, and I was doing the math on this. I figured that building was built in the late 1800s. Those trees were probably cut down in Michigan, I'm guessing, about... Uh, you know, late 1800s, they were probably 200 year old trees. And so we're talking about like pre settlement, um, pre European settlement wood here, I think. You know, so it's, it's uh, to me, I just love the, the real materials that, that, that kind of tell a story and mean something to the owners, you know, like, like the maple and the, oh, the ma uh, sorry, walnut and the maple. Um, yeah, so we did this really light railing system to let that light come in and bathe this wall. Um, some nice detailing here. We, you know, need to make every square inch ha count in a small house, um, and you know, Tom and Jen really totally got it. So, um, a little bit about mechanical systems. That little white box you see on the wall there is a mini split. So that does all the heating and cooling of this house. Um, with passive house, you basically need about one tenth of the heating and cooling energy of a built to code house. So it's really a kind of amazing fact. Uh, factor for people to figure out. You know, you think about how big a furnace is for a regular house, right? And then you think of what's, what's 10 times smaller than that? <laughs> and the answer is, yeah, one of those. Um, so because the house is so really well insulated, you don't have cold spots and hot spots so much, you know? So you can get away with doing a non-ducted heating and cooling system. There's no, there's no ducting for, for that. It just puts a little bit of heating and cooling out right here, and it sort of flows around the house. Um, What's moving the air in the house, though, is a ventilation system. So I call it the lungs of the house. And um, it's, a, it's a really cool system. I'll let Brandon talk to this. So yeah, it was great. On the last tour, one of the people came up to me afterwards and said, so where are all the mechanical systems? Or where, actually, where's the mechanical room in this house? And you know, that's the great thing from both the homeowner's perspective, that you're not paying for this giant room just to throw a bunch of equipment in. And I guess, I'm guessing from a designer's perspective, like not have to design a house around the mechanical room, but actually design and then figure out where those best kind of fit. So that's kind of the great thing. It is very small. You see the heating and cooling unit just on the wall, and that's it. There's no closet for the rest of that system. Um, and, you know, the way of doing sustainability and, and green building, you know, it's a holistic approach. So what Tom's talking about on the salvage floors, all these things kind of come together with the energy side, the building science we talked about outside with the vapor flow and moisture. You know, there's a lot of technical things that go into it on the building science side that grant us the energy efficiency and the durability and longevity of the home. Um, but, you know, on the health side, health and energy, like correlating those together, you know, the ERV is a perfect example of how those things can really work well together. So uh, this house is very super airtight. Um, we don't have any air leakage around windows or gaps and cracks. You know, we had to make sure we sealed it really well for passive house and just good quality construction, really. So. It is a very tight envelope, and we want to be the ones that bring in the fresh air. We want to make sure that fresh air is where we want it to be, not just in kind of the deepest, darkest corner of your basement or, or window or something like that, but actually controlled. So what we do is we exhaust the, the air out of the kitchen's bathroom and laundry area uh, through an energy recovery ventilator. And then the incoming uh, fresh air is preconditioned by that outgoing air and then dumped above the beds or in the living area. So you get that fresh air exactly where you need it and no room in the house becomes stuffy. And because we only have a point source heating and cooling system, that becomes like a kind of a Vitamix for the house and that it's mixing up all the air temperatures uh, throughout to really kind of get that even distribution or even out the distribution of the heating and cooling. The specific ERV we use in this house is a conditioning ERV, a serve they call it, and that one actually does trickle a little bit of heating and cooling into that airstream. So uh, a typical ERV may have some losses. I think the most efficient one's 93%, uh, so you have 7% loss. This one will help buffer any losses from the actual unit on that incoming to outgoing exchange, uh, which is great. And it can also do some dehumidification that way. So on a day like this, we can dehumidify that air a little more than a regular ERV would be able to do. And it's also demand controlled, which is pretty cool. So uh, CO2, VOCs, um, you know, it's tracking these things in real time. And when it sees that it goes above a set point that we've kind of set for it, it'll start ramping up the speed on that ERV. So it's kind of hands off. The clients don't have to worry about it. You don't have to 
uh, push a lot of buttons or if someone's taking a shower, the humidity is going to go up in the house and that's going to demand that we get more ventilation and more extraction from the, uh, the returns. And since we want to be a balance, that means more supply to the other living areas in the home. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the great part is that you get this really energy efficient system that also is producing you know, great human health and wellness because that air is healthier than outside air. It's filtered by um, really high quality and, and capturing filters. Um, as far as the mini splits go, I've heard some even tight homes have um, comfort issues in some of the bedrooms. But I think uh, I'm looking at something that you might have put in here to help um, avoid yep. that issue. Can you talk yeah, to us about that? Girls, yeah. So yeah. These, these are uh, um, just transfer girls that basically we're pressurizing those, pressurizing those rooms with the ERV. So we want to give some relief to that. And this allows, they're acoustically dampered transfer girls, so no, noise doesn't go through them so much. Uh, so you still get the privacy, but the air will come back out and get it extracted here. It's going to get extracted back out through the laundry area here or around that corner to the bathroom. So we have the, in this house, you know, the exhaust kind of pretty well balanced throughout and the surrounded by um, supplies. So those kind of all congregate towards the middle and filter back out through the ERV and back in. So. It's interesting with these transfer grills that if you have a temperature difference across the door when the door is closed, you, it'll induce convection basically using the undercut of the door and mm -hmm. so it'll balance it a little bit but yeah it is true that you can get differential temperatures when you start shutting doors we've noticed it more when we didn't have the conditioning ERV but when we had a standard ERV because in the summertime the air coming in through the ventilation system is normally going to be a little warmer and a little more humid mm -hmm. than the indoor set air I mean that's just the nature of the efficiency of the system so yeah, you close that door, that room will continue to get a little more warm, a little more humid. So with the conditioning ERV, it's sending the fresh air in at your set point uh, temperature mm -hmm. and humidity. So it's really nice. Um, but let's 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 do the technical stuff with questions. Uh, but you guys want to see the house, so <laughs> so let's just do a loop here. You can see the bedrooms are over here on the east. So go ahead and poke your heads in, especially look at the uh, the uh, screen porch over there, the sleeping porch off of the second floor bedroom. And then um, let's kind of loop around through here, and you'll see the ventilator if you want to see that. And then make sure you poke your head and look at the bathroom the way we're using the natural light to these soft um, glasses. I don't know how we're doing on timing. Like we, I think we're good. I think uh, yeah, I've been I've been trying to keep myself a little more hemmed in than in years past. We're doing the coordinate tours, but. You want to tell us a little bit about the um, serve a little bit more? So this is the conditioning ERV. This is the unit that is controlling the airflow in and out of the house. Too. This is what's giving us the fresh air, the healthy air, uh, the lungs of the house, if you will. So um, you know, they said the kitchen is the heart of the home, or these are the lungs of the home here. And what it's doing is basically uh, it's extracting the air out of the kitchen, bathroom, laundry, kind of those wet areas or areas that produce moisture and odors and then uh, it takes it through the ERV and dumps it outside but the incoming fresh air stream they exchange some energy so heating heating or cooling depending on season uh, and then this system itself also has a little bit of a heat pump built into it I think it's about 3,000 BTU so it actually preheats or pre-cools that air so you don't have that a little bit of loss between ambient temperature in the house and what's getting just, uh, supplied now we're supplying the areas like above a bed above a couch living areas where people need uh, fresh air, that's where we're supplying it. And it's actually healthier than outdoor air because we're filtering it through a, a high capturing filter to make sure um, that that air filtering through the house is great quality air. Uh, and you can see on the, on the actual sensor, this is demand controlled. So it's monitoring temperature, humidity, uh, CO2, and VOCs. And when any of those get above a certain uh, set point that we've set for it, it will ramp up the speed on it. So this is kind of a, a hands off. Uh, there's boost switches in the bathroom, so you can actually go in there as an occupant and boost it yourself. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, this system, if, if that, it averages out the, uh, what's coming back to it from the house, so if those averages get out of whack, 
you know, it'll start ramping up things on its own. So you don't have to control it yourself, which is pretty great. And this is actually a relay switch that relays back down to the, the uh, cooktop. So when the cooktop goes on, it automatically boosts the kitchen. So we're making sure, you know, that's the highest uh, uh, exhaust air in the house is the kitchen area. But that gives it an additional boost once things fire up uh, and they're cooking or something like that to keep VOCs down. And, you can produce VOCs or any kind of odor is basically VOCs. So we want to keep those down to a stable part. Mm -hmm. You see, CO2 is, is high in here. We have had this is the third tour group through, so the system is starting to ramp itself up uh, to try to bring that back down to like 900, is where we have a set point for. So definitely want to keep that you know below 1100 on a typical place. But you know this house was designed for a family and, and entertaining guests, not for you know 68 people at one time. So thanks. You should check out the ceiling on the uh, sleeping couch out there. Oh, yeah. Pretty cool. Up all up above? All, all, the, all the connections and all that. Oh, okay. I didn't look up above. You said there's a bathroom on this floor? There is a bathroom. Yeah, if you come through this door here. So the R value per inch is higher for the poly ISO, and it's a little more expensive. It's it's, it's roughly a little bit. It depends on your tool. A little bit, yeah. How much is thicker? Right. The same ratio of R value in your versus yeah. see the uh, drain pan in there installed above the first floor to ensure if there's any leakage it catches it in that drain pan and doesn't uh, leak to the bottom uh, or the second floor or cause any kind of flooding or damage to the house and then outside of that we have to have enough foam that we're protecting the plywood from never getting the condensation temperature and that's why we don't need it one thing you'll notice is it's afternoon here in Illinois in the middle of the summer. Plenty of natural lighting, barely any lights on in this house. So your dew point will never ever, so you'll always be somewhere about the dew points in the sky. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's why we're not worried about the way One thing I didn't show you was just the unique ceiling design in the uh, three season porch almost outdoor sleeping area. Which overlooks the backyard. This product is uh, one we really like because it's helping uh, to buffer kind of occupant behavior. So we can build the healthiest home, you know, not completely not toxin free home. And that's great for the construction and when, you know, we leave the job site. but. You know, we know that homeowners are going to move in, and they're probably going to bring some existing furniture and things that maybe they didn't know about when they they built the healthy house for a reason. But maybe prior furniture and stuff like that, they didn't have that knowledge at that point. So this is great because it gives them a buffer on that. If they bring something in that has a little uh, VOC content to it, this will absorb it. It absorbs it actively for like 30 coats of paint or 70 years, uh, whichever comes first. But uh, it's a great way to kind of add that that buffer on being able to clean the air actively and it's through a drywall product that's got to be there anyway. So it's kind of a passive system and you put it on and that's it. So uh, everything else works just like normal drywall does, except that it has that additional capacity to do something great for the health and wellness of the occupants inside. Is there a certain paint that you have to use for this? You don't, have, I mean, you don't want to put wallpaper on it or something impermeable, mm -hmm. um, but you know, any paint can go on it. You know, they also make paints. Uh, some companies, like Ecos, makes a paint that is also uh, VOC eating oh. product. So you put both of those together, and now you're like really increasing the amount of VOCs that are actively just being absorbed and stored in your walls themselves. So that's pretty great. Great. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Something I didn't know, but like. Taking us around the back and around the side of the house here. Little garden. And we're going to go talk to the landscaper in a second here. Uh, the landscape plan is not completed. So let's go in and take a look. And if anybody has any questions, we are live. Feel free to let us know. Or you can talk to, you can contact Brandon 
at Evolutionary Home Builders or Tom Bassett Daily at Tom Bassett Architecture if you have any further questions or concerns. I think so, yeah. 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 <laughs> chosen based on uh, prairie grasses. So the house basically was intended to be so like oh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's sort of different. Yeah, exactly the fall color. Yeah. The fall color of the prairie grasses. Um, so it all kind of tied together. Uh, I think nicely inside out. They talked about the sort of inside out, this sort of sleeping porch or this porch you can see here where you have sort of an outdoor sitting area. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of the main sort of points of view into the, that landscape. And they have a little boy um, who, would, who likes to play, you know, outside and so we have a tree fort um, or more of just like a, a play fort, I guess it'd probably be on the ground. But So that's part, that's part of the feature of this sort of woodland habitat that's at the back of the site. Yeah, so I think it continues to be a work in progress, but in everything that you can see in the house that's, you know, the same concepts are basically just then taken out of the landscape outside. But looking forward to seeing it come to fruition. Yeah. Are you, are you, an, are you guys architects or designers? Or? So this is our, uh, this is what heats it cool. Or, this is the hot water tank, so this is what heats the hot water in the home. Um, Study, since we're not using gas here, which is most prevalent here in the Chicagoland area, uh, we're using an electric uh, hot water heater. But this is not just a standard electric hot water tank, it's actually a heat pump hot water tank. So, pretty great. You know, the, the most efficient uh, gas tanks, I think, are, can be 99% is the best they're, they're ever going to get. Um, whereas these units, for every, every dollar you plug into it, you can get over $3 of energy back out of it. Um, so it is really a great product because of the efficiency of it. So basically what it's doing is it's extracting the heat that's already in the air, out of the air, and producing hot water from that. Uh, there's different settings, so you know, a small family can probably operate in heat pump only, then there's a hybrid mode, um, and then there's high demand, and then you can go to electric only, which is the least efficient, and just, um, but lots of people in the house or some crazy reason you need that much hot water, this tank can kind of fluctuate itself more than that. Unfortunately, this tank is no longer being manufactured, so, uh, but there are plenty of other heat pump top water heaters we're using because building a passive house, we're trying to eliminate gas out of our projects. You can never build uh, a net zero home and have natural gas because you can't offset frack natural gas energy with solar panels or wind, but you can 100% of the electric, so, uh, or even more, so, you know, gold being net positive, really, trying to produce more than you consume and, you know, feed a little bit more back to the grid or store it on site, depending on your situation. Uh, but point being, we can get there with an electric system, and there's other great choices on the market that we can use to achieve that. Hmm. Uh, but water is so important to sustainability. You know, people think energy uh, is the main driver, and this is really energy efficient, but it's also uh, great for water. And we have to think of water holistically for the house, too. So um, the way we design our plumbing systems, you know, our hot water piping is, is really well planned out, and we try to keep uh, the lines really short and compact, or you design, like this house has two bathrooms right above and below each other, so you get really fast hot water that way. And other projects that are more sprawled will have a main trunk line and design uh, a system off of it that can produce hot water at any tap at any point in less than five seconds with less than uh, a cup of wasted water. So really, really efficient system um, for that. But you gotta think of how you're distrib distributing the hot water. You have to heat it, and then how you distribute it is also important, or how you design it to be compact and, mm -hmm. and everything tight together for hot water demand. And laundry is all right on the back side of the bathroom upstairs as well, so again, real tight. Um, and then as far as the septic here, this house is not tied into sewer and water because it's on this great forested lot here. Uh, so we have a septic system. Uh, and we actually, instead of doing a standard septic system, this is actually a bio-barrier system. So it's, it's a more sustainable element. It does cost a little bit more for that. Um, but what it, it helped us achieve on this site was to keep this, um, the the field smaller than it would have needed to be. And the water that comes out of that field is much cleaner than, uh, actually has an NSF rating, is, is cleaner than it would be out of a typical septic system as well. And you don't have that chance, as much of a chance for the sogginess of the field um, as well. So there's a lot of, there was a lot of benefits. And we didn't have to build these giant mounds for 
things that kind of flushed the, the lot out a little bit nicer and made more usable yard because now you can use that field for recreation and play. So, so now the system it doesn't have to be pumped out like a conventional. You mean? Yeah, I mean your your typical home. Uh, you know, there's septic and there's alternatives. You know, you could also have wastewater treatment plants in your basement, yeah. um, and then you know, trickle irrigate your garden. This water is great for irrigating gardens, so they could actually put a garden and grow vegetables and stuff down at the bottom of the hill and uh, be able to grow some great things in there because you know there's always going to be water coming out that way. So kind of a self irrigation system. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the typical municipality, one of the greatest expenses is the amount of energy or the amount of dollars they spend on their wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, it's a, a huge waste because we have all these centralized uh, wastewater treatment plants and you know this kind of decentralizes here is by necessity but you can do this in, in different places or you can even do wastewater treatment plants localized in your basement mm -hmm. or you can group like several homes together there's always other ways to think about it but the enormous amount of wastefulness and the energy that municipalities spend on uh, uh, sewer systems and pump stations and pumping stuff uh, we won't say that word, but all the way across town and things like that, you know, it's, it's a huge way. So this is a kind of a great system and to showcase for sustainability of water itself. Mm -hmm. Now, is that system allowed? If sewer was here, would they have been allowed to do that? Would they have to connect? Because I know there are... I think there would be some, uh, we'll call them hoops to jump through. Right. It depends who the municipality is and yeah. what their objectives are. And, you know, there's some municipalities that are really great these days with trying to be ahead of the curve on sustainability. They know it's coming, so they want to be at the forefront, which is awesome to deal with. Mm -hmm. There's others that need to be talked to and, and bringing in professionals or experts or scientists. And, you know, we've had all sorts of different people at different tables mm -hmm. to be able to kind of push through, or not push, but, you know, get through more sustainable uh, factors that we want to implement in our buildings to really be at the forefront of, of the sustainable building technology. Great, great. Yeah. Um, and one question on the heat pump. Um, or two questions rather. I know those have the ability to dehumidify. Is that a, a benefit? It uh, is definitely in the summertime. That's that is a byproduct of it. Is as uh, is there's cool air coming off of it, mm -hmm. uh, which in the wintertime does you know add to the heating load a little bit. But mm -hmm. you know, we're, uh, in the summertime, the benefit is that you get the cool air that is also yeah, right. dehumidified a bit. So so yeah, in the winter it's pulling heat out of the house. So are you, right. have you sort of pre-designed for? That the, or... the cool thing about that, yeah, definitely, and the ERV is kind of again mixing up that air and, yeah. and boosting. They have a heat pump built into that, so it yeah. boosts some of the heating as well. Um, but you know, the heat pump is the same way. For every dollar of energy, the heat pump heating and cooling unit. Mm -hmm. Lots of heat pumps in this house, uh, but the heat pump heating and cooling unit uh, again operates that for every dollar you put into it, you're getting three dollars uh, mm -hmm. and twenty five cents or something of, of energy out of it for heating and cooling. And again, the same thing here. So. Although you have some losses from that system, that system is also super efficient, so um, they kind of help to neutralize each other. Mm -hmm. Now, do you um, compare a system like this and a system like the mini splits um, versus like a full blown geo with a D superheater? Um, I mean, there are are there any reasons you go with these instead of that, or is that case by case? Um, you know, I'd say it's case by case. You know, from what I've seen locally here, and this changes depending on where you go regionally and things, but. Uh, the amount of money it costs to drill uh, wells in an area like this close to Chicago, um, you know, it would never pay itself back mm -hmm. on this project basically because we're very, we're so tight, we're so, uh, our loads are so low that um, for one, I don't know that the geothermal, any manufacturer really make a unit small enough for this house and I think there's one that's commercial based now but it's not residentially focused product. Um, but yeah, the equipment sizing, getting something so low to handle a house of this, you know, 1,800 square feet with um, such low load. And then the other thing is the cost to do it and, you know, it just would never, never pan out or, or pencil out for us with what we've seen so far. So this system costs, you know, uh, even with the ventilator and everything, you know, we're talking an HVAC package that's probably a third of what a geothermal system alone would be. And then there's no ventilation on that. That's just heating and cooling. Sure. So, uh, now where I think geothermal would make sense is you know, uh, retrofits on Victorian buildings or things that you can't really get in there and be invasive and really get a good air seal on, or like large buildings, so uh, commercial warehouses, yeah. industrial, those kind of places where you have larger loads, then it can start penciling out. But uh, for really small homes, I think uh, best to look at, you know, upfront costs, the energy efficiency of it for operational costs and how much energy you're using. Uh, how much do you need to, to get yourself down to the low, small solar array to get to net zero net positive energy and then kind of um, pencil it out that way. So our clients on this project, uh, you know, 
Instead of spending the money on geothermal, now they can spend money on solar panels and still be less than they would have been for that geothermal system. Is this house uh, pre-designed for solar? Is it solar every, ready? Ho every home we build is, uh, is net zero ready, so we have the infrastructure in place, everything's behind the walls. Uh, up on the roof, uh, outside by the electric meter, everything's in place so that all that has to be done is buying panels, uh, twisting some wires together and you got yourself a, a working array. Great. Yeah. So Hi, I'm Jen Tellerico, I'm one of the homeowners here. And I'm Tom Smith, and I'm the other homeowner here. So um, if you guys could tell us a little bit um, you know, why you made this commitment to uh, you know, a type of home that seems fairly unconventional to code and, and sustainability. and just tell us a little bit about um, you know, how you got here. Okay. Um, well, we had been working at a house in Downers Grove as well, where we are, and um, got to the point where we had one final push, and it was a, the most expensive final push. And so when uh, Tom and Brandon came over to take a look, just on kind of a whim, we said, well, how much would it cost for us to build a passive home? Because we were aware of them. We've been working with Tom for a long time. Mm -hmm. And when they told us uh, how close it would be in pricing and everything, we thought, well, this is what we're all about. Because our intent is to have a, a light footprint, to do things efficiently, um, and yet still have a, a nice lifestyle. Um, so, you know, to us, being energy efficient and conscious of what we're doing with the environment is important. We have a son, and we want to teach him to take care of things. Uh, so we have to take care of things to set that example. Anything else to add? <laughs> no. uh, have you been, how, uh, have, how long have you been getting? You've been here long enough to get any utility bills, or? Um, probably not a good. We don't have a full year. We yeah. moved in the day after Thanksgiving. Okay. And the floor is still curing. Okay. So we're not getting typical results. But what we have seen is that every month it goes down, 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 down. And some of that is because we're in summer, but some of it is because um, at least I feel like we're more aware of how to live in the house better. So um, it's definitely less than we were in our conventional house. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us out. All right. My pleasure. All right. And just a reminder that this course is approved for half an hour in certified um, passive house consultants uh, at the US CPHC. And so make sure to do a screen grab right now so you get this link right here, which is your self-reporting link, and then your self-reporting uh, verification code, which will be right at the bottom below that. Um, so make sure to screen capture this if you need it or um, rewind it to get it. Um, and we just want to thank uh, all of our board of directors our members, our volunteers, uh, you for watching this, and a huge thanks to our uh, sponsors, uh, Sun Intuitive, self Tipping Glass, um, Build Equinox, CERV, Geocomfort Geothermal Systems, Niagara Conservation, Lowest Blowing Toilets on the Planet, Panasonic Ventilation, and Certainty Air Renew, Formaldehyde Eating Drywall. Big thanks to them, thanks to you. Go pick up your um, continuing ed. This is actually going to be, unlike most of our courses, this will actually be five question quiz, 80% passing rate, Grab that certificate and join us on the next one. Thanks.